It's all right. Yeah, before we, before we start, if you want to say something, David, too, as well, um, just a real quick report on the camping trip. We, it, it must have been successful because there's no kids here. They wore them out. And so, David, uh, you know, Jeff, what do you want to say about that? Oh, yeah, the leaders, if you can still stand. These yeah. Guys, you can't see Chris is in the back there. Yeah. But these guys, they poured their selves into these kids. I mean, 100% of the time. How many hooks do you think you baited? <laughs> and that was just with, like, the two kids you were with. So these guys, they were, they were, they were working on building relationships with these kids. Uh, I know that Andrew focused on a couple, uh, Katie focused on a few girls, and, and Chris was, was great at helping us set up and, and cooking for us, and, and David was awesome. We, we, uh, we had a good time. The main goal when we do something like this is to, uh, of course, have fun, but we're going we're gonna to wear these kids out. And by the time we get down to the, fire, the fireside talk at the end of the night, um, they are tired. They are, are it, it, it lets them drop their guard to where they're really open to the, to the gospel. And so we, we uh, did a, a, a study on, on hell and, uh, you know, is hell real? What, who is hell created for? Um, what is hell like and how do we avoid it? And so it's like the, the if you're, drowning out in the ocean and you don't know you're drowning and somebody throws you a lifesaver you're not apt to grab it if you know you're drowning then you grab the lifesaver if you right. know there's a need for you to be saved and what you're going to be saved from that's a big difference in how you accept the gospel and that's, that's right. what we did last uh friday night and it was a it was a powerful gospel presentation i think it was taken very well um, but we, uh, we really appreciate the, the support that we had from the Nances. And from, so that's where we were, uh, Jim Nance's son, uh, Heath Nance. He hosted this uh, in Summers, Arkansas, and it was, it was a good time. We did a lot of fishing and a lot of just plunking around in the creek, and it was fun. Thank you. One of the neatest things is a couple of the girls that were with us, they had never been camping before, and one of the girls caught her first fish. She wouldn't kiss it. Yeah. <laughs> she did touch it before we threw yeah. it back. <laughs> so we would like to think that having an experience of like a first like that, that she caught a fish. Um, I talked to her a little bit afterwards and said, we can talk about this later, but Jesus talks about being, making you fishers of men. And so I'm thinking that we've got them, we've got the kids on a really good path. And so if it wasn't for the love and help and the support that you guys have offered, we wouldn't be able to do that. So thank you guys. All right. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I, I'll be honest. I praise the Lord that there's younger people willing to do that than me. I am so glad. Heath, called, Heath texted me. He said, are you going to come by? And I said, no. <laughs> maybe, maybe if you guys want to put together a glamping trip, I might uh, pop in for something like that. But yeah. No, I don't sleep on the ground anymore. All right. Uh, take your Bibles, please, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And as we come to this, uh, this chapter, it's kind of unique because Paul gives an answer to a very difficult question that existed in the church of Corinth. And, and really not just Corinth, it was actually throughout the Roman Empire. And that's, the question was this, can a Christian eat meat that had been offered to idols? And while this issue might be foreign to us today, in Paul's time, this was like an extremely important issue. It involved both their domestic life, it involved their social life of, of Christian families, of, of how, you know, really to fulfill the words of Christ, how can you be in the world but not of the world? And how, how do you relate to a world that's really, you know, in, in, inebriated in, in sin and how do you still be a part of that when you're called out of that? And, and what's the whole issue about? William Barclay, I want to read 
little longer than I normally do, but I want to read this to you because I just want you to realize how serious an issue this was. He writes, sacrifice to the gods was an integral part of ancient life. It might be of two kinds, private or public. In private sacrifice, the animal was divided into three parts. A token part was burned on the altar. The priest received their rightful portion. The worshiper worshiper himself received the rest of the meat. With the meat, he gave a banquet. Sometimes these feasts were in the houses of hosts. Sometimes they were even in the temple of the God to whom the sacrifice had been made. The problem which confronted the Christian was, could he or she take part in such a feast at all? Could he possibly take upon his lips meat that had been offered to an idol to a heathen God? And if he could not, then he was going to cut himself off almost entirely from all social occasions. In public sacrifice, that's the second part, after the requisite symbol amount had been burned and after the priest had received their share, the rest of the meat fell to the magistrates and others. What they did not use, they sold to the shops and to the markets. And therefore, even when the meat was bought in the shops, it might well have been offered to the same idol or to some heathen god. What complicated matters still was this, that the age and this we're talking about both Jews and Gentiles, believed strongly and fearfully in demons and in evils. They were always lurking to gain entry into a man's body. And if they did get in, they would injure his body and unhinge his mind. We see some evidence of that in our world. All right, never mind. Uh, These spirits settled on the food as a man ate and so got inside him. That was the belief of the day. And one of the ways to avoid that was to dedicate some meat to some good god if therefore, it therefore followed that man could hardly eat meat at all that was in which was not in some way connected to a heathen god. And could the Christian eat it? To the Christians in Corinth or any other great city, this was a problem which pervaded all of life, which had to be settled one way or the other. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, let's look down in verse 7. We're going to read the passage in a minute. But he says, Yet no one uh, knows what will happen. Oops, nope, I'm in Ecclesiastes. Let me go to Corinthians. <laughs> That's a great passage, but it made no sense right there what I was trying to read to you. All right, verse 7. However, not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to idolatry up till, till now that when they eat their food sacrificed to idol, their conscience being weak is defiled. And so when Paul addresses this issue, it's one of the questions that they had asked him about, that there were some that had a clear conscience and others were burdened. And so what do you do? No doubt both of them were quoting from Ecclesiastes, which I was going to go there, uh, chapter 7 and verses 16 and 17, where uh, he writes, don't be excessively righteous and be, don't be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Don't be excessively wicked and don't be foolish. Why should you die before your time? So the idea was don't be too hot, don't be too cold, find, you know, find that Goldilocks just right somewhere in the middle. Now, added to the issue, both parties felt like they had scriptural authority. And one group would be quoting Jesus, though John records it for us, or no, Jesus, uh, Matthew records it, Matthew uh, chapter 15. And yes, I know Matthew wasn't written at the time this was written, but Jesus' sayings were being repeated. So one group that was saying it's okay to eat meat offered to idols, they would be quoting Jesus, right? And he's a pretty good authority, amen? Um, Matthew 15, verse 10. Somebody in the crowd, he told them, listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles the per- a person. And even in Jewish culture, they believe that, that evil was outside, and the only way evil could get inside is if you, if you touched something that was unclean or you ate something that was unclean. They even named it, and their, their rabbis named the demon Shibboleth, uh, that, that if he kind of got in there, then you were in trouble. Well, I'm sorry, that is, Jesus clearly says it's not, he, he says it even clearer later on in the chapter in verse 16 when he says, do you still lack understanding? Don't you realize, verse 17, that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated. But what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And this defiles a person, for from the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, sexual moralities, thefts, false testimonies, slander. These are the things that defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile a person. Now, they would be quoting Jesus. 
The other group in Corinth, no doubt, were quoting the Jerusalem decree from Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. And I, I realize I'm sounding like the preacher that you know, solved all the problems no one had and answered all the questions no one was asking. I, hopefully, it's, well, you'll make sense of this in just a minute. But in Acts 15, remember, they, they had this same struggle about what do they do with, with, uh, with, with food offered to idols. And so the decree from Jerusalem said, for it, verse 28, for it, is what, it was the Holy Spirit decision in ours not to place further burdens on you beyond these requirements. This was the requirements for Gentile believers. That you abstain from blood offered offered to idols, from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that is strangled, and from sexual immorality. You will do it, you will do well if you keep yourselves from these things farewell. So here you had, and I hope you see this, this was a major, major problem. And now you might be saying, so what? We don't go to the Zeus book butcher shop these days. I mean, unless Tyson's got some little idols set up in their place, most of us eat our chicken without any thought about where it came from, right? And, and, so, and so really, why are we even spending time on this? Well, let me ask you a different question. Are there any disagreements in the church today over issues of liberty or freedom in Christ that the church disagrees with over today? Yeah, everybody's, everybody's shaking their head, yes. And the longer you've been in church, the more vehemently you're shaking your head. Um, do you ever, I mean, have you ever had anybody, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's one part I just can't wait to get to, so you'll, you'll see when I get it there in a minute. But what I propose is this. I propose by studying this chapter, I think it is relevant to us, First, First Corinthians chapter 8, we'll see not maybe the particular issue since it's meat offered to idols, but we will see principles by which we're supposed to operate whenever believers have a disagreement over an area, is this right or is this wrong? And, and, whatever, and there's a myriad of those issues. I don't even want to bring the issues up because I don't want to cause an argument here. Um, but let's read together our passage and then we'll come back and look at, at, the, at the principles. It says, now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. About eating food, sacrificed to idols, then we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there's no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or earth, there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father. All things are from him and we exist for him. And there is one Lord Jesus Christ. All things are through him and we exist through him. There, however, not everyone has this knowledge. Some have been so used to idolatry up until now that when they eat food sacrificed to an idol, their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us closer to God. We are not worse off if we don't eat, and we are not better if we do eat. Oh, please memorize that verse in this morning. All right? But be careful that this right of yours in no way becomes a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, the one who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged to eat food offered to idols? So the weak person, the brother or sister for whom Christ died, is ruined by your knowledge. Now when you sin like this against, your brothers, against brothers and sisters and wound their weak conscience, you're sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. Father, I pray that you would guide my words and my thoughts as we study through this and that we would rightly divide your word this morning, that we would understand the message you would have, not just for them, but for us today. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the principles, there are at least three, and the first one's this. The overriding principle is this, is that love builds up. Love builds up. Now, scholars all agree that that phrase where, and it's even in quotes in my Bible, uh, about food sacrifice titles, we, we know that we all have knowledge. He, and he puts it in quotation, at least the translators do. And the reason they do that is that it's that familiar expression, I know. Yet, does anybody have kids? And you talk to your kids, and they go, I know, Dad, and I... To which I, that's one of the times I argue with them. I go, no, I don't think you know. 
They go, no, Dad, I know. I know what you're going to say. No, you don't know, because if you know, you wouldn't do it. We're, you know, you say you know, but I don't think you know. And, and I, I think I'm on the edge of provoking your children to wrath. I know there's a verse that says something like that, maybe not do it or whatever, uh, but it's such a great opportunity. I, I don't know, I hate to, hate to miss that chance to point out that they don't know is what they think they know, you know. And so you raise your kids, I did mine, and Let's not talk about that. We'll just keep going here. Yeah, that enormous. But have you ever, how do you feel when someone uses that expression on you? Well, everyone knows that, right? And the implication is everyone knows except you, you big dummy. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's always, well, everyone knows that. Well, I don't, apparently they were saying to Paul, we all know, we all possess this knowledge that we're all free to eat meat offers to idols. And Paul's response back is that not everyone knows. He says, we all know, but no, they don't. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. He even says that, and he says it later on in verse 7. Not everyone has this knowledge. So not everyone understood their freedom. And this love puffs up. This is not, by the way, the first time they've heard these words in this letter. Now, it's interesting that they're translated different, at least in this translation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 6, he says that um, none of you will be arrogant. The purpose is that none of you will be arrogant. And that's the word. What puffed up means is arrogant. Puffed up. It's found in 4.6. It's found in 4.18. Now, some are arrogant. And some of your older translations, they, they keep it the same. Some are puffed up. Some as though I were not coming to you. It's also used in chapter 5 and verse 2, and you are arrogant or you are puffed up. I, I don't know why that stuck with me, but I like that. He's, he's like saying, you guys are all full of air, you know? You ever known somebody's all puffed up? You just want to poke them. To, to let the, I feel like that's God's gifting in my life, to let the air out of those puffed up folks and you, you operate in your calling, I'll operate in mine. Um, but when you look at verse 2, when he says, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not know it as he ought to know. That's the nicest way of saying, you know, I like the New Living Translation. It says, anyone who claims to know all the answers doesn't really know very much. <laughs> I, like that. I like that translation even better. Isn't it nice that the Bible says, you're not really as smart as you think you are. <laughs> you <know? laughs> that would be the King J translation of, of that, of that. But... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, that's bad, that's bad. It's Father's Day, give me one, all right, there we go. Yeah, knowledge puffs up, but love, the opposite of, of being puffed up and arrogant is love builds up, and, and this is so key for those that understand their freedom in Christ. Do you realize you have a choice as to what you do with that knowledge when, you're, when you know you're right? You can either be all puffed up and pretend you're all big and bad, and I don't have to listen to you, and I don't have to live by your rules. Or you can combine that knowledge that you have of your freedom, combine it with love, and build somebody else's life up. And what you're going to see throughout this chapter is a choice of being selfish or being selfless. And, you know, if you're selfish and just puff up and go, you're, you know, arrogant, you're, you're wrong. You might actually be factually correct in the, in the, in the circumstance, but your actions instead of helping someone else come to a place of freedom in Christ, you actually wound them and hurt them. Later on, we'll see that you're actually sinning against them. So you have a choice. David Pryor writes this, The spirit in which we say what is right is as much as part of the truth as the knowledge we articulate. Let me read that again. The spirit in which we say what is right is as much as part of the truth as much part of the truth as the knowledge we articulate. Because you can either puff up and pretend you're all big and bad, or you can combine your knowledge with love and build up someone's life. And Paul's point seems to be this. Knowledge about the ritual and religious origins of a particular chunk of meat, either in the market or at your host dinner table, um, all will achieve nothing to build up the faith of your fellow believers. And the important matter is the impact of their life on what I might do. My behavior matters, right? So does yours. My knowledge of my freedom will achieve nothing except impressing others if I'm just puffing up. If on the other hand, you take the time to 
carefully react how your fellow Christian might react, and then deciding accordingly on how I'm going to behave, Paul says you're building up the body of Christ instead of tearing it down. And, and I, I'm trying to say this in so many ways so that you catch this message, my friends, that when your knowledge is regulated and released by love, then you're clearly demonstrating that you know God. And in fact, um, he, he just declares that in verse 3, but if anyone loves God, and loves God here, loves God enough to love your brother or sister and be mindful of them, it says he is known by him. He is known by him. I like some of the other translation. This one is known by God. And by way of application, here's the first two lessons that we learn from our passage. First is don't, let's go up to the slide here, the next one. First, don't assume or presume that everyone involved in a disagreement has the same information or knowledge. If someone flares up at you about something you might be doing or thinking about doing, don't just assume that they know and that they're being a stick in the mud or whatever. No, don't assume they know the knowledge. They may not understand their freedom in Christ. And so you know, don't assume or presume. Second, love is to be the governing factor. It builds up rather than puffs up. It's revealing factor. It shows whether we are known and whether we know and are known by God. So that, that's the first two lessons from the first principle. Second principle, the foundational truth or fundamental truth that there is one God in verses 4 through 6. Now, I read it to you earlier. Again, I like the New Living Translation here. It says, well, we all know that an idol is not really a God and there's only one God and no other. According to some people, there are many so-called gods and many lords, both in heaven and earth. But we know that there is only one God, the Father, who created everything, and we exist for Him. And there is only one Lord Jesus Christ, whom we have been given life. I mean, you folks, these false gods are that, false. So don't act like they're real. If you react in fear and shock and panic, oh, oh, oh they're going to get me, no. Are you really demonstrating faith in God? Those are false gods. They're not real. I want to read a couple passages to you. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 9 through 20. Isaiah 44. Boy, just, just the sarcasm with which he writes to just try to get their attention. Verse 9. All who make idols are nothing. And what they treasure benefits no one. Their witnesses do not see or know anything, so they will be put to shame. Who makes a god or casts a metal image that benefits no one? Look, all its worshipers will be put to shame, and the craftsmen are humans. They will all assemble. They all will assemble and stand. They all will be startled and put to shame. The iron worker labors over the coal, shapes the idol with hammers, and works with his strong arm. Also, he grows hungry and his strength fails. He doesn't drink water and is faint. The idea of the guy that creates the idol is fallible. And yeah, it's very clear. <coughs> then he switches to the woodworker. He stretches out a measuring line. He outlines it with a stylus. He shapes it with chisels and outlines it with a compass. He makes it according to a human form, like a beautiful person to dwell in a temple. He cuts down cedars for his Use and he takes a cypress or an oak. He lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a laurel and the rain makes it grow. A person can use it for fuel. He takes some of it and warms himself. He also kindles a fire and bakes bread. He even makes it into a god and worships it. <laughs> he makes an idol from it and bows down to it. And then the sarcasm. He burns half of it in a fire. He roasts meat on, the, on that half. He eats the roast and is satisfied. He warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. See the blaze, he makes a god with his or his idol with the rest of it. He bows down to it, worship, he prays to it. Save me for you are my God. You see the picture that he's painting? How foolish, how foolish, how foolish. Such people do not comprehend and cannot understand. For he has shut their eyes, this is God now, so that they cannot see in their minds, so that they cannot understand. No one comes to his senses. No one has a perception or insight to say, I burned half it in the fire. I also baked bread on its coals. I roasted meat and ate. Should I make something detestable with the rest of it? Should I bow down to a block of wood? 
He feeds on ashes. His deceived mind has led him, led him astray, and he cannot rescue himself or say, is there a lie in my right hand? That's deception, folks. That's false idols. One more. That's probably enough, but one more, just because it's Father's Day. It's my gift to you. Psalm 115, all right? Psalm 115, verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk. Oh, we read this. Yeah, we read this earlier. They cannot make a sound with their throats. Those who trust in them are just like them as all who trust in them. And then he says, Israel, trust the Lord. House of Aaron, trust the Lord. So the fact is, and Paul's going to deal with this. Go back to 1 Corinthians because in chapter 10, he's going to address this issue later. And, and, and basically what he's saying to them is, is there's, there's no such thing as other gods. There's, there's only one true God. And the truth is, if you have found some other form or some other God, it's actually not a God at all, but a demon. In 1 Corinthians 10, 19, he says, what am I saying then? That food sacrificed to the idols or anything? Or is that idol is anything? No, I, but I do say that what they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup with demons. You cannot share in the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we provoking the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So yeah, we stay away from idols. We say, and the application to the Corinthians is simply this, idols are nothing. Since there's one God, not honoring another so-called God or Lord by eating a piece of meat, there's no one there to honor and again, you might say, well, who, what about us today? How do we apply this? Have you ever met a believer that maybe is afraid of little glass crystals? I sure have. The only time these, these people are in favor of crystals if it's on a little ring, you know. <laughs> and then they want that big thing to shine and reflect all the light in the universe. But otherwise, oh, oh, oh you're worshiping New Age gods. Uh, <laughs> Did you catch that? The, you know, the engaged girls, are, hi, that's how they wave, you know, depending on how big the rock is. And I don't know, the Didi changed her wave much. It wasn't that big, uh, but we were poor. But yeah, the people that want these, and I, it really bugged me because somebody gave me a crystal to hang the, that it reflected the light and it was so nice. And then someone said, oh, you're, you're worshiping new age. I'm like, no, I kind of like the light. Since when a false god's own science, man, when light rays hit a, a crystal and it's cut, by the way, it's all cut by, he, it's not like that rock popped out of the ground like that. Some craftsman shaped it so it does that. And I think they're beautiful. I'm just going to make a point. If you see a crystal in my car, don't say, oh, he's worshiping demon. No, he just likes those lights that shine out of there. A rainbow. Promise of God, never destroy the world again. I I can come all sorts of Bible reasons why. Besides that, I've had people chew me out about it. And I'm like, have you guys forgotten we're on the winning team? N not you. I was saying this to others. They were, they were like, oh, you're, you're, allowing, you're allowing evil influence into your life. You know what? The last time I read 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, oh, oh where we, here we are. It says, you are from God, little children, and you have conquered them. Nike, that's Nike, I love that word, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. I still like the old translation, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, amen? Yeah, let's just start living like we believe that. Let's start pretending that we're on the winning team. Do you realize you guys were all a part or will be a part of the army of God? When Jesus returns in Revelation chapter 19, what a beautiful picture of his triumphant return. And I believe it follows the rapture and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what, but it says when he came in verse 1 of chapter 19, I could read the whole team. I just tell you, I want to read the whole thing to you. But I just want you to look. It, it says in verse uh, 6, Then I saw something like the voice of a vast multitude, the sound of cascading waters, 
and like the rumbling of loud thunder, saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. What, notice the tense. Because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, white and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. And, and folks, were that mighty armor, that rider on that white horse whose name in verse uh, 11 is faithful and true with justice, he judges and makes war. And when he comes down, man, we are all with him, right? And we're on the winning team. And we don't have to be afraid. Um, by the way, when you look at Chapter 20, this is a great verse to memorize too. It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound for a thousand years. You realize he does this one-handed, holding his car keys? <laughs> you come over here. You know, I'm going to wrap you up. We always think Satan's this big battle. He's just like, God. no, he is not. He's a fallen angel for sure. But when you read carefully through the book of Revelation, you'll discover he isn't the toughest angel on the block. I can't wait to meet this one, Revelation. And I think we'll all call him Sir. Sir, how are you? Yes, God bless you. You know, Snatch up Satan and bind him with a chain, holding a key the whole time. That's pretty bad in my opinion. All right, all right. you have your own sanctified imagination. I've got mine. Third lesson we've learned back to Corinthians is this, that the one God, that's, that's what he says in chapter 8 and verse 6, that there's only one God. You don't have to be afraid of all these false gods or false idols or anything. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father. All things are from him. This was something, by the way, he said, remember back in chapter 1 when we first started our study of Corinthians? Chapter 1 and verse 30. He says, it is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us, our redemption, sanctification, and redemption. In order that, as it is written, let him, one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Listen back to verse 6 of chapter 8. All things are from him, and we exist for him, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him, and we exist through him. Folks, you you win. Amen? There's one God, the guy that created it all, and he's given us life through the one Lord, Jesus Christ. Well, there is another principle that we'll consider. And again, remember the first principle is that love builds up. Second principle, there's only one God. Third principle is what we'll call the supreme consideration. And that is considering the brother for whom Christ is died in verses 7 through 13. And he starts in verse 7, however, not everyone has this knowledge. The spiritual reality is this, not everyone understands their freedom in Christ. They either they're not taught it or they've not caught it. And, and the consequence for them is that if they do eat meat offered to an idol, they defile their conscience in verse 8, now, now he has something to say about that. But you say, wait a minute, defiled conscience, what are you talking about? Well, Romans chapter 14 and verse 23 says, But whoever doubts stands condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. And everyone that is not, everything that is not from faith is from sin. And I, you might be saying, wait a minute, are you, are you suggesting that the Bible teaches situational ethics that something's right or wrong based on the circumstance? No, that's not what the Bible says at all. What we're talking about here is the reason a person's conscience is defiled is the question of sin itself. Or maybe a better question is more specifically is when does a person sin? When do I sin? Is it do I sin when I commit the act in and of itself? Or do I sin when I decide in my heart that I'm going to do this thing? It's wrong. I think Jesus made that crystal clear. Matthew 5, 28. Do I have that verse up there? But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus made this clear. Sin does not begin when you do the act. It's when you decide to do the act that you think is wrong. And 
defiling your conscience becomes a sin because the sin is your rebelling against something you think is wrong to do. Now, this is a hard thing to learn, and I think it's a lesson you got to think about and pray about and really get the Lord's guidance in your life on that. But let's, let's just using something. If, if I'm going to take a drink of alcohol, for instance, if, if I think in my heart, maybe I was raised in a home where we were taught that that was sinful and you know anything to do with alcohol is sinful and if you touch it, you're going to hell or whatever. If, if your conscience is sensitive that way, you, you, you should never drink. You should never drink if it defies your conscience. But if you come to a place of understanding and what I would say that your freedom in Christ is in that Drinking is, is never condemned, although in Proverbs, I think like two-thirds of the time that it's mentioned, of the 20-some times that it's mentioned, two-thirds of those times it's mentioned in the negative, only seven times is it in the positive. So it's about two-thirds to a third. But, but sin has always been drunkenness. It's never been the actual drinking of an alcoholic beverage. But yet the church, we adopted the temperance, you know, time of, well, you should just never drink. And I've heard people say, well, keep from getting drunk, I never drink. Well, that's God, God bless you, but you can't, employ, you can't impose that on somebody else. And, or they come up with these things about, well, the wine in Jesus' day was watered down and it wasn't, you know, non-alcoholic wine. Well, then how come they warned them about getting drunk if it was not, if you couldn't get drunk with it, how could you, you know, their, their, their logic is kind of messed up. They warn you about drunkenness, what did Jesus say? No one puts old wine or new wine in an old wine skin. Why? Because the new wine ferments. Boom! The bag is gone. So, I know you're thinking you're making a defensive drinking. Maybe, but you know, just go with it on that. You know. And if your conscience is clear, and and I, I'll. I'll share with you mine if you ask me privately, but my conscience, well, my conscience is clear. I can, I can drink a glass of wine and not feel any guilt on that, but others can't. And guess what? For them, it's a sin because they violated their conscience. They knew, they thought something was wrong, but they decided to do it anyways. That's where the sin comes in. Now, I got to be careful about this because I'm not suggesting you guys go out and have a kegger, you know, I'm not trying to promote anything here. Um, I, I do want you to understand that not everyone has freedom in Christ. Second is a spiritual principle that goes along with that, that God is not impressed with what you eat or don't eat. I love verse 8. Food will not bring us close to God. I could show you several Christian books that say the exact opposite. That if you adopt this Jewish diet, somehow that'll make you more spiritual. Anybody else seen those books and articles? And yeah, no, it will not. No. And they start saying that. I go, no. Food. That was so disappointed in Rick Warren when he started promoting that, you know, Jewish fasty thing or whatever, you know. Hey, food will not bring us close to God. We are not better off if we don't eat, and we're not better off if we do eat. I was perfectly content without any. Strike on my conscience this morning when I took a glass of milk and put it in a cooler thing and carried it to the church office here. And the reason why is because I have to keep this, my Pop-Tarts here at the church. Because no. um, not everyone has freedom in our house. And so I, yeah. and I had my blueberry Pop-Tart and I was like, thank you, Lord. I praise God for that blueberry Pop-Tart. I nearly praised him for two packages, but I decided I'm going to, Use self-control, and I just had one. That's why I feel so energized right here today. Now, for some of you, it would defile your conscience, and I'm not going to tell you where I've got them hidden in my office for that reason alone. <laughs> yeah, food doesn't bring you closer to God. You know, where, how did I, where did I go? I lost my place here, so... I'm still thinking of a pop tart. Brown sugar cinnamon are the absolute. They are the absolute best of the best. Yeah. God is not impressed by what you eat or don't eat, and you can take that to the grocery store. <laughs> that was the problem. That's why I ended up with pop tarts down in my office because I was walking through the grocery store. The rule is, don't go when you're hungry, right? Because I'm walking by and they sell them there in these giant boxes for $3 or whatever. I'm like, yeah, I'll take one of those. You know. 
came home, Didi's like, what? <laughs> Actually, I came out the next day, they were all on the table. Take those to the church and give them to the youth group. And I didn't do that. That's... <laughs> didn't want to lead any of those kids down a wrong path. Right? <laughs> Last one, spiritual response. The spiritually strong must restrict their freedom for the sake of the weak. And there's so much to learn here, but the point is, it's, it's just living selflessly. And notice how he says it, be careful in this right of yours. In no way becomes a stumbling block, literally an occasion for stumbling to the weak. So just be aware, if someone sees you, one who has this knowledge dining in an idol's temple, won't his weak conscience be encouraged and to eat food offered to idols? So the weak person, and notice it says the brother, now this translation says add sister, brother or sister, or it just says, so the weak person, the brother, but notice the next four words, for whom Christ died. They're not a stiff, they're not a prune, they're not spoil sport, or party pooper, Mr. Just Say No. No, he or she is someone for whom Jesus loved enough to die for him. And when you insist on your rights over the one for whom Jesus died, notice he says you're sinning not just against um, them, you're sinning against Christ. When you sin like this, he says you're sinning against Christ because you're not considering the body. You're not considering the body. Folks, we need to consider one another. Amen? Let's close with verse 13. Therefore, if food causes my brother or sister to fall, I will never again eat meat so that I won't cause my brother or sister to fall. It's just about living your life for others and not for self. Let's pray. Father, may we operate within these principles of love and building up and not defiling others by their lack of knowledge and help us rather to set aside our rights, to lay aside our lives and the rights that we have. The same way Jesus did, he certainly was the ultimate sacrifice in that all the things that he gave up in living his life so that he could do your will and be the sacrifice for all of us. There's too many to think of or comprehend. But greater love is no one than this than a man lays down his life for his friends. May we live to that standard, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, God bless you. Happy Father's Day. As you take your fathers to somewhere to eat, remember it doesn't matter what they eat. <laughs> it's all, it's no judging. It's all good. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a great day.